So thanks for watching guys. This is part two of the Dana transfer case rebuild video. And this video, I'm going to actually show you how to obviously put the whole transfer case back together and some of my tips and tricks on how I do these. Maybe a little bit unconventional, a little different from other videos that you've been watching, but please check it out. And thanks for watching and please subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Let's get to it. So I've got the rail mechanism held in a vise with a block of wood. It's pretty stable. I'm going to show you how I remove the rails without messing with the detents, which are below the rails with little springs and balls below these rails that you can actually remove through these holes over here. So we're going to take these rails out, clean them up, take the end cap off, change the seals and put it back together. I'm going to take these cotta pins out. I'll probably replace them with some new stainless pins. Now that the pins are out, you can remove this little piece that holds the two rails together. We're going to take off the end cap, which has got a half inch hex on it. <clears throat> so if you look at this, we've got two seals and the rails are kind of rusty and we would not want to have these rusty rails go in and ruin new seals. So we're going to take the rails out one at a time and then change the seal and then put them back. Okay, so I got a collection of drumsticks here, uh, some Pro Marks. This is a 2B stick, and uh, some Vic Verts. This is my Thomas Lang model, and uh, my signature Paul Blackard Wrong sticks. Now, I like using this particular one because it fits about the same size as the rail. You can use, of course, any wooden dowel or any particular shaft you have, but I happen to have some good drumsticks laying around and I cut the end off the stick so it's nice and blunt and I'm going to stick this inside where the rail goes so I don't pop the detents out. So anytime you have a rail system where the detents are blind, and by that I mean that you can't remove the detents externally, they're in the case below the rail and the only way to get at the detents is to physically remove the rail. You have to rotate the rail to compress the detents. So some of these rails you can rotate this way, you could try and see which way it works. And you might have to change the positions of the rails. Like for example, this particular rail right now, I can't move. This particular rail I can. So I'm gonna go rotate this this way, which is clockwise. I got a little bit of a punch in here. We can feel it snap. So now that I've got this rail like this, I'm gonna slide this rail out, but I'm going to also put a drumstick at the end of this so that I don't have the detent come out. Let's see if that works. See? I'm using a nice 2B size drumstick. It fits perfect there. So we're going to do the same thing for the other side, same thing. I'm going to just clean up the surface a bit. And I'll clean up the rails and reassemble it. Now in the event that you do accidentally pop out the detent, you're just going to have to use a screwdriver and a magnet and push it back in. Now some kits you can get, they have new detent improvements, like some washers and stuff you could stick behind them. But we're not doing this uh, transfer case gear set change or anything like that, so looks good. All right, another thing I do is I, once I've got the rail all polished and cleaned up, I'm gonna just put it inside the fork, make sure it slides okay, nice and easy. 
all right? Because sometimes if you have some burrs on it, you don't realize that, and you're trying to put this thing back together again, and then you find that it doesn't fit in the case that easy, and you're going to fight with it. So you're going to have some burrs on the rail. You might as well remove them beforehand and make sure it slides nice and easy through the, the fork so that when you're doing your final assembly, it's no big deal. It goes in nice and easy. It's a little tip. All right, so I just want to show you another thing. These are the detents for the rail, and this is your little interlock slot. So detents are always going to be pointing down, and the interlock slot is going to be facing towards the opposite rail. Or if you don't want to do that, you can mark the rail. I put a couple of notches in the rail so you know which rail goes where. In case you're taking a unit apart, you have it left in a tank, and you don't know, I can mark the top of the rail with the corresponding hole, so you know where it goes. So sometimes it's better to just be a little bit careful before you disassemble things and reassemble them so you know exactly where things are going back together, especially if it's the first time for you. So I've greased this rail and I'm going to install it back in the hole. I've greased everything so I don't cut the seal up. We're going to get it started. We'll do the, other, the same thing with the other rail. So I'm going to use some new hardware here. I'm going to put a little of this thread locker. It's a uh, pump gel, red Loctite. Just a little bit on there. I'll torque this down to 20 foot pounds. A little fresh grease on these pins here. So after I've got the rail assemblies done, I like to work on the input and output shaft sections of the transfer case. Now, this is the input shaft bearing retainer. Do this seal on that one. Do the seal and the bearing on and races on the output shaft bearing retainer housing. And we're going to have to set the end play on the input shaft and the preload on the output shaft. Now, one important thing to know is that when you're doing these end play adjustments and preload adjustments, you kind of do them outside of the transfer case, so you're not having to keep on taking these housings off to make your adjustments. So it's a little bit of a pain to set this stuff up outside of the transfer case, meaning I'm going to have to take this output shaft, I'm going to have to put the gear on it, let's say the, the washer, the bearing, the housing, set it all up with the, you know, with the shims to do my preload. Because if I do this while it's inside the transfer case, then I'm going to have to deal with trying to get these shims out of here and stake this back off the case, which is a tight fit. So I know it's a little bit of a pain, but it's worth it sometimes to do these sub-assemblies outside of the main case. All right. Now, one thing I did notice is that this input shaft had some wear on the pilot, and I'm going to show you what that's about. But this pilot is worn, and it's got to be changed, so I got a new input shaft coming in hopefully it'll come in in a couple of hours I got that going and we're going to get this going for you so let's get to it so if you can see here on the input shaft you have some galling on the needles you can see the needle bearings left these distinct marks here on the input pilot this pilot goes inside the output shaft and there's needle bearings inside now what typically happens is if you don't use this piece and it's indirect it's coupled to the output standing still and as a result any type of movement any type of load will eventually indent the needles so it's a good idea to always maybe run this in neutral the transfer case or in low range so that this thing spins a little bit and the needles get used the 
the new idler shaft, 8620, a couple of spare O-rings. Nice new input shaft. Advanced Adapters makes these beautiful pieces made in the USA and their idler shafts are beautifully ground, not like some of the aftermarket shafts that have a very rough finish for the needles. Uh, same shaft actually using their Atlas transfer cases. So it's a really nice piece. Good to change because it's a bearing surface. Look at this beautiful new input shaft. Actually has a little bit more spline engagement compared to the old one over here. See that? Nice piece. Now, because we're using a new input shaft, we're going to have to set the end play. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the new bearing on this. I'm not going to show you how I press it on right now because we're going to have to take it on and off a few times maybe. So I'm going to just put this bearing on here and then we're going to go through how I set the end play on these. All right, so I got the bearing pressed on. And what we want to do is we want to just put this gear on like this and we're going to put the snap ring in place. You want to try to get this down to zero end play. And you do that by putting a shim in between the bearing and the input shaft. So I could feel we have a little bit of a play situation going on here. It's not much, but nonetheless, let's measure it. So you can take a feeler gauge if you don't have one of these. Uh, they're available on eBay. They're all over the place. I think Harbor Freight sells some. It's going to look like it's going to be around four to six thousand, so I'm going to guess. So you could take this now and you could slide this feeler gauge in over here in between the two pieces. Oh, it's actually, there we go. There's five thousandths. Try five thousandths. So I can slide five thousandths in between these two pieces here. Pretty much that's about all I can get in. Let me try six. Six goes in as well. That's really tight with six. So what I'm going to do is take this bearing back off. I'm going to put a 6,000 shim behind this bearing. So now we get rid of the end play this way. Okay, so I got some shims. I'm going to measure them. Uh, got this one's about 11,000. So that's too big. This one here. This looks like it's going to do the trick. This is about five and a half. So this should be perfect. I think this will work fine. So it's five and a half thousand shim. Gonna place it on this like this. Then I put the bearing back on here like that. Okay, and you're gonna be pressed on. Now you can, you're supposed to press in from the inner ring so you can put some sort of support on this bearing. Flip it around this way if you'd like and press the thing home from the input shaft like this. All right, so Today I'm going to show you how I use my bearing heaters. Now usually I don't use them in most of my builds because I got to take them out for one bearing, let them warm up, and it's really not necessary. But we're going to be doing a number of bearings for this particular job. So it's a good idea to have this heater going, getting it ready so I can expand the bearings and put them into place. Now this is a cheapo heater, it doesn't have a thermostat on it, so I use this infrared thermometer from Harbor Freight. It's really easy. You want to try to get these things up around 200 degrees, 220 degrees, something like that, so I can point it on there. I'm about 148, 150. I'm going to just drop the inner ring down on this. What's good about this, it'll heat the inner ring of the bearing and not the outer ring, so that, that won't affect issues if you've got to slide something in place in the housing, but that's not really the situation here. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of wait and to heat this inner ring up on this bearing. Right now I'm at 138, 39 degrees. It's climbing, okay? Once we get this thing nice and warm, then we can kind of drop this bearing right in place. A lot of times it's good to do this if you have multiple bearings, again, like I have on this transfer case. Otherwise, pressing is a lot easier. But this thing is going to be warm, ready to go. It'll make my assembly a lot easier, especially working with a heavy item rather than banging bearings on with a hammer or anything like that. All right, so I got this bearing up to a little bit over 200 degrees now. Let's give it a shot. It's getting at about 200 degrees. So if you want, you could use some WD-40, cool it down, work with it faster, okay? So I actually use an old Muncie bearing retainer, and the, these things fit really perfectly in this. And I do it this way so I can just pop out the, the seal inside. You could just take a punch 
and pop the seal out. So what I'm going to do is just drive the seal out of the, the retainer. So this kind of supports it pretty good. And I'm going to just pop the seal out. So take some of this, uh, I use this anaerobic sealer, this gasket maker, and what I'm going to do is put a little bit of this around the seal. Even though that there's already sealant or some sort of paint around the seal, I like to use this gel just in case. This way I get no oil leaking around the seal. So I'm just going to coat it with this gel. Put it on here. Now you don't want to damage the seal, so I'm going to carefully use a driver and bring the seal down. Now I this driver doesn't really fit exactly correct. But I'm gently hitting all the sides so it goes down flush and not bending the seal. That looks nice. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just grease this, okay? You always want to grease your seals. You grease the seals for two reasons. You grease the seals so that in applications, the spring doesn't pop out of the back. It's an old trick of mine. It's been passed down many years. A lot of people don't realize that these springs that hold the seals and give them tension around the shafts can actually fall out. So by putting a little grease on the back side of the seal, it keeps the spring from popping. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put a little grease around this edge here to help the bearings slide back in place better. So I'm going to use the transfer case as a support for the retainer because obviously if I put it in support here, it's going to push it back out again. Put it here, make sure it's seated correctly, get the snapping started in the groove, fish it around with a screwdriver. Now if you've been doing a lot of these, sometimes you'll have screwdrivers cut with little grooves cut in them to facilitate you in doing this type of work. Looks good. Now, if our end plate calculations are right, we should be able to drop this down into place. Still put on that snap ring. There you go. Now the whole assembly set up, no end play, it's solid. So I can do the same thing here. I'm going to lay the Output shaft extension housing. Just gonna fit it on here somehow. So I can just pop out the bearing in the back here, and this, when I pop out the bearing, it's gonna take the seal out with it. All right, so I've got the bearing and the seal out. Now, sometimes you can actually reach around the bearing and turn the bearing this way and hit it with a punch and knock it out, okay? And once the, the bearing is out, you can then take out the race and basically the race press in this way. So we punch it out from the back and do the same thing from this race here. We punch them both out from the back. So I'm going to clean this up and then get the races back in here. So I have a lot of cracked transmission cases laying around. And the reason why I keep them is because they have holes in them that sometimes I can use to drive bearings out like this. So I'm gonna just lay this down here. I'm gonna take a punch now and go onto the back edge of this bearing that's in the inside like this. 
and punch out the bearing brace, okay? So I know you can't see it all, but this is what I'm gonna do here. It's not too difficult to understand, I hope. So we're just gonna get in here. I'm gonna walk the bearing out. But once you get it started, then you can reach under the bearing better and knock it through. I'm working side to side like this. That's one. Look at this. The bottom bore looks like this will work perfectly. This is an old crack TKO 600 case, by the way. There you go. Here's the other race. So we're going to clean up these journals. Make sure there's no dings or anything on them, no burrs. If you want, take a little 800 grit paper, kind of go over everything, clean it up a bit. This way, the new races go in. You want to make sure they seat solidly against the inner lip that there's no damage to it from using a punch, like if you slipped or something. Now, what we have to do is we have to set the preload on this outside of the case. It's a little tricky first. And then assemble the whole thing in the case and then put the seal on afterwards. So I'm gonna just go over this with some 800 paper real quick, clean it up. What also works really good is these copper scoring pads, but I couldn't find any in the supermarket. They say like chore boy on them. They're excellent for this type of stuff because they really don't gall up the aluminum. I don't recommend using any type of whiz wheels. People like doing that using these abrasive wheels to take gaskets off the surfaces. Now these are precision surfaces, especially when you set the end play on them. So I wouldn't recommend on the, uh, on the gasket surfaces using abrasive cutoffs. Like you can see there's a little bit of a high spot there. I want to make sure that it's out of there. This could be dirt. Just cleaning it up really good, okay? All right, so it doesn't really matter what side you start on as far as putting the bearing in. And of course, you're going to put this race with the shoulder facing down towards the step. Now I've got these, believe it or not, again, Harbor Freight cup drivers and they're pretty good. You can use this and just Work the bearing cup in. So what I want to do is I want to look to see that the shoulders of the bearings are seated perfectly against the stop of the housing on both sides. That looks really good. And so now I've got all the new races installed in the extension housing. Okay, so since I'm setting up this unit with new bearings, I could just put it together with the old shims, but I figured I'd show you the procedure. You don't have to do it, but I'm gonna show you the procedure for basically checking the preload on this particular output shaft section. And it's a little bit, again, redundant. I have to do everything outside of the case. So I'm gonna to have to simply put on the gear Put on the thrust washer. Now we're going to press on this bearing. Okay, so I pressed this bearing on the output shaft with the gear in place and the thrust washer. And I'm doing this again to do the preload settings outside of the case because it's a lot easier. Although I must say this is a very tight press fit and probably when you reinstall this in the case it's not going to be that easy to do unless you heat the bearing. So I'm going to drop the extension housing on now. I'm gonna take the shims that I took off of this unit and put them back on. They go in next. Then I'm gonna drop down the pinion bearing. Now this may have to be tapped down a bit. So this is the way 
When you buy one of these heavy duty Apple Chef kits, they pre-assemble it just to make sure that uh, everything fits properly and that the preloads are set correctly when you purchase them. Now what they'd shoot for is zero end play. I've got no end play on this unit, but I'm gonna go torque it a little bit down to the spec that they say, which is 200 foot pounds. And it's kind of tough to do. We're gonna have to put a little wrench on here to hold it in place while I use the torque wrench. So I have this old pipe wrench I use for this stuff and I try to catch it on the squares of the, the yoke. The setting here is 250 foot pounds. It's at the max of this wrench. So you're really gonna be working it hard here. Oh. Ah, oh, it's a workout, man. I got some preload. I could feel a little drag. This is nice. So everything worked out well. Let's break it loose again. That's the type of wrench I got. That's a big ass wrench. So if you recall, this pilot area was worn and this is what the cup bearing looks like that goes on here. Now this cup bearing has to come out of the input shaft. Normally I use a pilot bearing puller. I expand it and yank the cup out. But for some reason I could not get this cup out. I do not know why, so I had to cut the cup out. And usually what you do is you just, these are very brittle these races are super hard and so you kind of have to go in there and mangle it up a bit to get it out and so usually stick this in here now get the cup out. And looking at this cup bearing, you could see the indentations in the race. It may be hard to see, but there's some indentations right over here. So this whole bearing and input shaft were shot. You could see these distinct grooves, which is very weird. But this again is from it not being in low range or neutral much and always staying in direct. And this bearing just getting pounded to death over time. So I'm gonna clean the inside of this output shaft and press a new bearing in. If you notice these bearings have uh, a rounded side and a square edge and you want to put the rounded side in first so it kind of helps square it with the output shaft. So here I'm working it down and I'm being careful not to damage this bearing and make sure that when I'm pressing it in it's going to be flush with this surface a little bit below it. It can actually go past it, so you don't want to do that. I've just got it flush right now with the surface you can see here. So I use this EPG grease and I kind of just want to pack the bearing really good to make sure that on the initial fire up it doesn't run dry for any reason. Plus, I don't know how long this is going to be sitting before the customer actually uses it. So in the meantime, I got the output shaft pinion bearing being heated and I'm going to position now the output shaft in the transfer case so I can drop that bearing down. Okay, so I've got the transfer case case on a four x four block of wood. I think it's a four x four. What I'll do now is I'll slide the output shaft. I'll get it started in here and then put this gear on it, all right? So I'm gonna kind of go like this, put this gear in here. So 
So now the gear is on that shaft. I'm going to take this. This happens to work really well. I'm going to put that anything. You can use anything. I got this tub of grease holding it in place. I'm going to drop the washer down on it. Just like this. Now, with that bearing hot, I should be able to drop it right in place. Okay. So I'm going to let this thing cool now before I start assembling the rest of the upper shaft housing and everything on there. Now, I could have done this whole torquing down of the bearing and setting the preload up inside the case as well. But my preference is to do it outside of it. Now we're going to put on the extension housing. And the extension housing, I use this anaerobic gel and this Dynatex Blue thread locker on the splines and also on the bolts. So what I'm going to do is put a little bit on this all the way around, just lightly, doesn't have to be much. And the blue thread locker is going to go on the bolts. The bolts appear to have had some sort of blue thread locking compound already on them. And usually what I like to do is just smear this around by, by hand. I don't want a big bead on this. I don't want it squashing out into anything. So you're going to do this with the same thing on the shims on the other side. Just a light coat. That's all you need. Make sure it's uniform. Now what you can do is put the shims in there already so they're all in place. So now that I've got this all coated and the shims in place, I've actually got this whole Alpha shaft assembly supported by some ball bearings below to kind of keep it up in the case makes it a lot easier to work one. Now, everybody might have their own little way of doing it. So what I'm going to do is just tap this down onto the case and put some blue thread locker on the bolts. This also helps seal the bolts too because the bolts are not blind holes. They go right through to the unit. So you don't want oil leaking out of the bolts. And you're going to torque these down to 30 foot-pounds. That's sufficient. The back end of the unit uses these large-headed bolts, all right? In case you mix them up. Unfortunately, this seal is kind of hard to put in because I don't have the proper driver for it, meaning to clear this. So we're going to have to gently walk it down with a hammer. And most people are not going to have the driver, okay? So this is what you have to do. So I've got some sealant I'm putting on the outside of the seal just in case this paint doesn't do the job. I always do that. I'm going to use the anaerobic sealant on the outside of the seal. There we go. Looks good. Now you want to put sealant on these splines inside the yoke so that when you push the yoke in like this, the sealant is going to squash out this way. And that keeps the oil from leaking past the spline, obviously, and out of the output shaft. So you should always run sealant on the splines. Now whatever excess sealant is on is going to just squash out, okay? But I want to make sure that I have all the splines covered with sealant. That looks good. 
Now these usually will kind of just drop in place, okay? You can use this anaerobic gel on a nut. It also acts like a thread locker. Once I've gotten the wind play, then I'll set the torque again with the torque wrench. That's hard. That feels really nice. So I'm going to fish the slider through the case. Get it up on the hub. go. Now we've already greased the inside of the bearing. This is going to just simply plug into this way. What I like doing is, if you, it's hard to see, but you can actually see the markings from where this was before, where the indentations were, the pry it out. So I'm going to try to duplicate that same area. I got blue thread locker on these screws and you want to start them manually so you don't break them. Make sure they all align properly. Now I usually torque these down to 12 foot pounds. You got to be very careful because if your torque wrench isn't really that good, you can break them, okay? and wipe away any excess sealant. Nice and tight and nice and new. No end play anywhere. So these pads on the shift forks were worn a little bit and we're going to put some new pads on and they just simply pry off. It's no big deal getting these things off. Take note how they're put on though, okay? Notice that the pad fits on there. You can't put it on backwards or anything like that. So just want to pry the pads off, put new pads on. What you can do is you can also check that they fit, that they don't bind, fit good. All right, so I changed the pads on the shift forks. It's no big deal. They just kind of, you're just pry them out and pry in the new ones and make sure that the they are in tight, that they, they push in, that they snap into the back of the fork properly, that they're seated okay. And that's very simple. I can also check them in the slide and make sure they fit okay and they fit good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put the front output shaft assembly together. And so in putting this assembly together, this goes in first like this. I'm going to put the bearing on there, put this inside, then we're going to put the other big gear on the back of it inside and then put the other bearing in place.
so I got the bearing race pressed in now. It's all in, and I made sure it's flush with the back of the housing. And I kind of started the, the seal, okay? And I'm just kind of finding a spot I could put on this case again. There we go. So the same procedure as the other housing, just start the seal, but this seal was recessed below. So I'm going to put it in, make sure it's, it's recessed where it has to be. I'm being careful not to bend it, okay? But it was recessed, so feels good. Oh, so this is where it requires a few extra hands. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this assembly now into the housing. The seal again is there, the race is there. I'm gonna put it in, gonna start the yoke on it. Put a little thread locker on this one. Now this is preloaded by the shims in the back, but we're doing just, just to kind of take some load off of the system and get it in with the fork together. It's kind of a, a hard little tricky thing to do. Some people do it different ways, but I found it this way for a single person without any type of jig or stands, it's a little bit easier to do, okay? So I'm putting some of this EPG grease on the pads and I don't know how long this unit's going to sit, so I want some heavy grease on these pads so when it fires up, it doesn't burn up for any reason, even though there's supposed to be oil in it, right? And we're gonna lay the fork down in the case and we're gonna have that set screw hole facing upwards, just like that. Got the gasket on the housing. We're gonna get it started. Once I get this through the holes, You can see how alignment is critical. Everything has to align perfectly for everything to kind of go together, okay? So, now let's see if we can stuff this big gear in there and move it back.
catch all the bolts by hand. Then I'm going to run them in with a gun. Talking these down to 30 foot pounds. So I've got the transfer case on a block of wood hanging out here. If you had an engine stand, that would be ideal. But just as long as I can drop the bearing in here, that's all I'm looking to do and nothing more. So I've got it suspended by some wood. I've got the bearing heating up in the cone heater over here. And we're just going to let it get hot. And then we're going to just drop that bearing on. So these are the shims that come in the rebuild kits. i got some old shims in here as well. And, but this is what they look like. And there's different shims, and some of them are 5,000, some of them are 10,000, some of them are 40,000. And you can pretty much get your desired stack height that you need to produce zero end play on that front output shaft. I'm using the old shims because I'm not really changing any of the hard parts. Bearings, as I've mentioned in the past in some of my other videos, if you watch them, they're pretty accurate. And you can pretty much go to the, shim, the same shim heights. Okay, the same shim stacks. If I were to change the front output, then yeah, maybe I would reshim and set the preload, but it was pretty good coming in here. So I'm sure it'll be good going out. Put this thin one here. Now, some people use what's called Indian head shellac sealant, which is a very thin basically a shellac. It's a very thin substance that very liquid-like. That works very well and I believe that that's kind of what they originally used on these, but it's not easily available. Loctite again on these threads. So I talked these down to thirty foot pounds. Get this thing torqued down. So I figured I'd just show you what the shimming does on this plate over here. When you, even if you torque this down, okay, what's going to happen is you don't want to have any end play this way. And so this shim pack takes away the end play. So if you put it together and you have end play where you can move, you're going to have end play between the individual gears like this for oil clearance, but this should not move at all. And so if you have movement, you can adjust the shimming in the back to get rid of it and then seal your shims and be done with it. But this has no end play. It feels really good. Just torque down. And now we're going to go put the set screws back in the shift forks. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first stick the bit in the hole to try to center this fork first. Let this one move out of the way so I can get at it. So it's better to do this lower fork. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some grease going to just put it on here so that I can 
have the set screw kind of stick to the bit. You want know, to put a little blue thread locker on it, just a bit, and try to work it in here without dropping it in the case. Now we can move this fork back in position, the long fork, get that hole lined up. So what we have left, we have to put the idler shaft inside here, load it with needles, then put the cover on and we're done. So now I got to load the needles in the idler and you've got your center spacer, a row of needles and a small spacer, a row of needles and a small spacer, thrust washers on either end. So I use this Dynatex assembly lube, transmission assembly lube, it maintains its tack, especially in the high heat in Florida here. And I'll start with a row of needles. And these are heavy needles, okay? So I'm used to usually using this tack with some small needles. So they're gonna start slipping around a bit and I gotta work fast. Now some people use wheel bearing grease and they put the grease in their freezer or something to get it a little bit more stable and tacky. The good thing about this particular stuff, you can actually, once you get it set up in the job, it stays there so that you can come back to something later and usually the needles won't fall or drop down. And I'm trying to do is get these in as much as possible, as fast as possible, I should say, and then get that center spacer in there to kind of give them some support, which I think I'm going to just do right now. So you can, you can hold them with the center spacer. You should be using gloves with this type of stuff, but unfortunately, I just don't have the feel with gloves. The whole trick of putting this together is managing your weight and how are you going to do things without too much movement, get it in, get it done. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little trick. Now, you don't have to count needles because if you can't fit any more needles in, you can't fit any more needles in. Sometimes these small parts kit may give you an extra needle or two, hopefully not less. So I think I've got two extra needles here, you see. If you can't get that last needle in all the way, sometimes you gotta slide them in. There you go. Now, so we got two extra needles left over. Now what you want to do is take the idler shaft and push it through the gear outside of the unit to make sure, number one, that nothing's going to hang up while you're doing this while it's in the case. And you want to squeeze out the extra grease, okay? So that really helps give you a better pack as well. I don't know if you can see that, but that looks pretty good. Okay, so the trick is to lay the transfer case on its side and put one of the thrust washers in. Make sure the tang is in the recess, hold it in with some assembly lube. Once the wash is in place, it, the needles can't come out. Stick the other washer in, in the top, let it stick there, really good.
There you go. I'm looking down inside over here. I can see that everything's nicely lined up. Washers are in place, everything is good. I'm gonna drop in the idler shaft. Now we got a flat on the idler shaft over here. We're gonna make sure that it's lined up where the hold downs gotta go. And I'm gonna grease this because there's an O-ring here. So a few things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in the fill plug and I've converted to a magnetic fill plug. It had no magnetic fill plug and there's really no way of catching any junk. I'm gonna just leave this loose because obviously the customer has to fill it up with oil. And we're gonna put the hole down in over here and the tags that it came with. All these bolts seem to have had some blue thread locker in the past, so I'm putting some more blue thread locker on them. So I'm gonna slide in the hole down here. Like this. Position it. <clears throat> and if you're into talking this, you can torque it down to, you know, 15 to 18 foot pounds. I don't really think it's necessary to put a torque wrench on this, oh. but. So we got that done. Let's go flip it over here. We're gonna put the speedometer gear back in place. Now, if you recall, I did mark this over here. Uh, they're supposed to have some marks on here and I'm gonna be greasing the O-ring with this. And I had it like this before on the 2631 mark. And again, it's very crucial. If you put it in the wrong way, you can strip this gear, okay? So you'll see it kind of drops right in. I put it right with that little mark I made over here. Make sure we're lined up. That looks great. Now let's go do the, the bottom cover. See, if I wipe this sealant like this, it also will act as a thread locker. These rebuild kits do come with a bottom cover gasket. Now one thing that I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna just take a little gear lube and just put it on some of the gears. Now there's no synchronizers in this box, so you could use any gear lube that you'd like, and typically they are probably would suggest some sort of 90 weight gear lube. Um, I don't think 140 gear lube is necessary for this, uh, simply because in cold weather environments, that could be a little bit hard to lubricate some of the bearings in here. So I would stick to like an 85, 90 weight gear lube. I don't see any reason why that would be a problem with this. This came out really nice. Now there's a little indent in the cover. The cover can only go on one way, okay? So it just goes on like this. Lay it on there. You can always catch your bolts first. And don't just start running them in. Make sure you catch them. Especially with covers with multiple patterns, it's always good to catch the bolts so that everything is seated and pulls everything into place properly, including the gasket, okay? Then you can run them in. Work from the inside out. Now 
These I'm talking to 18 foot pounds. Clean up any excess sealant. I always say don't forget to wipe. I'm gonna take a little thread sealant and put it on the switch. Just a little bit like this. They use these really crappy aluminum plugs. They get all banged up. People use wrenches on them and squash them all the time. And so I've got these kind of trick little chrome steel plugs with an overing on them. They're very nice. So that transfer case I think came out really good. I think it's gonna give that customer a long service life. I mean, everything was really good inside other than that input shaft. I mean, the input shaft was worn, I think, from it just basically being in direct mode most of the time. So, you know, what's good about the Dana transfer case, by the way, there's no chains, there's no real wearable pieces that can go bad unless you don't change the oil in it, leave it dirty over time. And I think that's what helps. By putting in a magnetic plug, it kind of keeps any little debris from floating around in the bearings and chewing them up. So it's always good to actually change the oil in these maybe every 10 to 20,000 miles, something like that. Again, because there's no filters in it. So if you want to really maintain it, change the oil, and you'll probably have a super long service life for hundreds of thousands of miles. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Hit the notification link so you'll be notified of when I publish future videos. And take care. See you soon.